Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's session on the Book of Acts. Let's uh, pray and we can get started. So I just want to request uh, one of our uh, students here to please lead in prayer. Okay, yes, Asha, please go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for giving us another day and a, a breath of air in our lives, God. Lord, as we are about to start our class in the Book of Acts, that we may understand in depth and also grow wisdom and knowledge. Thank you for Pastor Nancy, Lord, as she is teaching us, Lord, that your spirit continuously use her to um, help us to equip and be um, knowing what you have for us, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for each one of our classmates that they'll understand, Lord, that uh, whatever they've been taught, Lord, that they will be the doers of it, and not just uh, hear God. Thank you all for everything that you're doing today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Asha. Uh, in the last class, we looked at uh, Acts chapter 20, where, um, you know, Paul, he was on his third uh, missionary journey, the end of that missionary journey. So he stops at various places. He was traveling with a seven member team. Um, and, uh, you know, he he went ahead, he ministered in a place called Troas, where we saw that there was uh, a person called Eutychus who, uh, uh, who was taken up dead you know, during uh, the time of uh, Paul's preaching, but uh, he ministers to him and then this man is brought back alive. And then we looked at the trip, the travel from Troas to Miletus. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, Paul gets to meet the efficient elders. Now these efficient elders, lived several miles away you know and some literature it says 28 miles some literature says 36 miles um but then the reason why paul met these efficient elders in Ma maletus is because earlier we saw that uh the the people in ephesus there was a lot of opposition that was rising up against him so they had planned to harm him uh, and which is why he did not want to go back to ephesus but instead he met with the efficient elders in uh, uh, miletus and over there he uh, shared with them his heart uh, it was a it was a farewell uh, message where he indicated to them that he would probably never see them because he had an idea about the path in which God was actually leading him. He uh, understood that he will go through a challenging time of trials and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and eventually even uh, lose his life uh, for the sake of the gospel. So. You know, he encourages them in so many different ways. He helps them understand that the church is precious, that God has given his own life for the church, and which is why the elders uh, really needed to uh, serve the, the church of uh, Jesus Christ with a uh, committed heart. And then he goes on to warn the leaders and say that there will be a time when uh, false teachers, false leaders will arise and, you know, they would cause... Uh, uh, a harm to whatever nurture has been been given to the people so far so you know there was a warning there was encouragement there was exhortation uh, and uh, before he left you know there's this very hard uh, touching uh, uh, time when they they sort of uh, embrace each other and uh, you know they they weep and they they just share their uh, wonderful fellowship and love for one another. So one of the things that I think I missed mentioning in the last class, I'll just touch on it quickly here. Okay. Okay, because... Uh, at one point here, Paul said that he has, huh, verse 27, 
uh, he says, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. So that term is uh, something very important for us to consider uh, in the ministry, the teaching ministry of Paul. Uh, he says that he did not just teach them. You know, sometimes we look at certain doctrines as um, favorite doctrines, uh, some even term them as pet doctrines, you know, where we are very happy to talk about some subjects, maybe the subject about grace or the subject about redemption or the subject about something else. So what tends to happen uh, when we teach God's word sometimes is we just dwell on one particular aspect and we don't really equip people in all the aspects. So as far as the teaching ministry is concerned, uh, it's very important for us to equip the believer uh, here uh, at uh, APC. Uh, and also like you would have seen this when we dealt with the local church, the APC publication, House of God, we, we have touched over there. We said that there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, disciplines which are important for the Christian life, so uh, one's walk with the Lord, so things that pertain to one's walk with the Lord and uh, becoming strong in the Lord, so spiritual uh, development of an individual. We need to teach on those things. We need to teach about matters related to ministry because every believer is, is called by the Lord to serve him in you know, whichever way God calls them. So Christian ministry is another important topic uh, on which we must actually build up the people so that they can step out and serve God. Uh, and uh, of course, life skills. You know, sometimes we miss out on very practical things uh, like, you know, how how do we relate with people or how do we manage finances? How do we plan um, uh, our time? How different things like this, things which have to do with people's issues uh, during a season of their lives, maybe marriage, you know, people are struggling with practical uh, questions. So life skills is another very important subject that one needs to uh, touch upon. So we are saying that Christian life is one thing that we, we need to teach and equip the people about. Second is Christian ministry. The third one is life skills. So these are just some broad categories, uh, but I'm sure you know, uh, you could have other subjects that you may want to equip the believer uh, with. But the whole counsel of God, you know, that's a uh, that's a, a good highlight there. Because uh, if one is not going to prepare the believer in the whole counsel of God, uh, something would be missing in their uh, in their experience with the Lord. And this is as far as teaching is concerned. But, you know, of course, if the believer, they themselves learn from God's word, equip themselves, um, you know, one can uh, anyhow grow. Like we don't really have to depend uh, on uh, only what, you know, is being taught to us uh, by somebody else. So just uh, something about the whole counsel of God. And uh, remember, he spent about three months, uh, Paul spent about three months in Ephesus. He was in the synagogues and, uh, you know, he was teaching uh, uh, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus. But then uh, about two years in the school of Tyrannus, he taught the people. So you can imagine, you know, many, many hundreds of hours of teaching. So uh, he would have covered any and every subject that he knew. And no wonder he's saying, you know, I've taught you the whole counsel of God's word. So, you know, some highlights there from uh, his time with the Ephesians. Okay, uh, say I can see that you've raised your hand. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about? Yes, Pastor. Uh, this, this is a very, very um, important and I think touchy area in the body of Christ. Um, because, um, you know, many people, respectfully speaking, they're called to certain areas and they say, oh, God has called me into this. God has called me into that. And every single thing about ministry revolves around that particular gifting that God has called them to or into that office. And so my question then will be, um, you know, how then do you convince such people that 
irrespective that God has given you an area of ministry, um, it's still very important that those who you disciple, you dis disciple them in the whole counsel of God. Because sometimes this is very difficult to pass across to you know, many ministers of the gospel to let them know that for a believer to be well-rounded and well-grounded, it's important that we don't leave out other aspects of the scriptures. But this is very prevalent right now in the body of Christ. So how then do you now convince such ministers, you know, not just to look only at the area that God has called them specially. The truth is that everybody has been gifted in an area by ministry or by giftings of the Spirit of God. But uh, when it now comes to discipleship, I think, just as Paul said, the whole cancer, but it's difficult to sometimes put this across to some people, some ministers of the gospel. So I, I know we cannot answer that question totally, but I just brought it up maybe again to make emphasis on this. You know, it's it's prevalent right now. Many believers are malnourished in the sense that because of the churches they go to and the emphasis of the ministry, they don't know other areas of the scripture. And so it's like when you talk about certain things of the scripture, they don't even know where it is in the scripture and the Bible. So it's really, really prevalent right now. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Say, for sharing that uh, concern. I understand, um, you know, uh, where you're coming from and um, your observation and because of which, you know, you're sharing this, that uh, many a time, many a time as ministers, we, um, we may want to stick with one particular subject or doctrine uh, because uh, maybe that is of interest to us. Maybe we are very comfortable talking about that particular subject alone. Uh, but as you said, you know, we have to grow in to considering the growth and nurture of the believers uh, whom we are raising up in the Lord. Okay. So I think that perspective is what needs to come in uh, say to uh, for us to understand as you know Ephesians 4:13 uh, it says that you have the fivefold ministry you know early on Christ uh, gave gifts to the church and then you have the fivefold ministry the pastor the teacher the evangelist the prophet the apostle so that is spoken and then verse 13 says for till uh, you know the believer becomes a perfect man Perfect man is maturity, tilios, till we all grow into perfection in Christ Jesus, and which is nothing but maturity, becoming more like Jesus. So uh, every minister, no matter which which uh, kind of calling they have, right? We we uh, just listed out the fivefold ministry gifts, uh, but you have expressions of the fivefold ministry gift uh, in many other ways right we we see so many other functions in the uh, body of christ where where there is service service unto god service unto the people of god but we have to recognize all that every person is doing for the maturity isn't it for the maturity of the people whom we are serving so I feel that is the the uh, perspective. Say, like, if we can give that perspective to ministers, uh, whatever capacity, fivefold or any other, you know, grace gifts, whatever, uh, we would know that we can't just stay with what is comfortable for us as far as ministry is concerned. We have to step in and serve uh, so that the believer is raised up uh, in. A mature way okay so i hope that that makes some sense uh say yes pastor thank you so much okay right yeah thank you uh and i can see here in our chat uh yes uh, good morning uh, everyone and uh, uh i can see 
uh, Kennedy asking, does it mean there is no specialization in terms of calling example some teachers? No, uh, say that's uh, Kennedy. That's not what we are saying. There is always, you know, a calling of God over each of our lives. You know, as Paul uh, pointed out, I think it is Philippians 3.12, where he says, uh, Christ Jesus has laid hold of me uh, for that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. So basically he says, there is a reason why the Lord Jesus called him. So that implies there is a ministry you know that for which christ jesus laid hold of me there's a ministry there's a call there's a grace there are gifts associated with that intention which god had for apostle paul so similarly for each one of us there is a that for which okay so that for which in a way you could say you know specialization uh, uh, sort of a related word that there is a special assignment there are special assignments uh, uh, you know a destiny if you if you want to uh, put it that way that each of us have of course we have that but the point i'm making is though we're all called differently we have a similar goal and that is nothing but in our service we are here to mature the body of christ Okay, so we should not lose perspective of that fact that callings may be different, assignments may be different, functions may be different, but we are all here to build up the body of Christ. Right? Remember in the last class we saw Paul said uh, the the church which was bought by the precious blood of Christ. So we have all been entrusted and made stewards of this very valuable um, uh, you know asset or treasure of god which is his body which is his people uh, whom he has purchased with such a great sacrifice so it is our responsibility to keep that in mind i don't just keep my in mind oh my calling is teacher so i just teach you know whatever I want because I have that grace, I have that anointing. No, but through my teaching, what is happening? What is the fruit of my teaching? Are people being equipped uh, to live, you know, their Christian walk uh, in love for the Lord Jesus? Are they producing, uh, you know, the the outcomes? such as the gift of the uh, spirit in their lives, the fruit of the spirit in their lives. These are all questions that one needs to ask about their own ministry. That's when, you know, we will know uh, that, hey, you know, sometimes I may have to, uh, it's not just about my teaching. I may have to serve in other ways, uh, which I am not comfortable with. But what is my goal? My ultimate goal is, Lord, your kingdom needs to be built up your people have to be mature okay so that's the perspective with which we have to work so when we say specialization no somewhere there is this understanding that uh, i'll just get better in my calling you know better in my calling and then you know, I, i'll just reach a limit and that's about it and i should be aiming for that limit not necessarily yeah get better in the calling and the grace of god but never lose perspective that everything that we are doing is for the maturing of the body of christ okay so just some uh, thoughts there kennedy and i hope that makes uh, a difference uh, say uh, your hand is raised again yeah, yes pastor uh, some thought just came to my mind that maybe i should just also um, bring up in the sense that um, i think it's also the responsibility of the believer uh, not just only to be fed within the local church, but also look at the body of Christ globally. Like, for instance, we are all on this call. I'm very sure many of us are from other churches. We are benefiting from APC, not just from our local churches. So I think just that perspective, in order for us to grow and to receive the whole counsel of the Lord, is to identify what God has graced us with in the body of Christ in order for us to be rounded in the whole counsel of God. And I think ministers also to, must also allow their members, you know, not just only because there's, there's a tendency for, for ministers of churches or pastors or teachers, you know, to kind of arrest their members to only listen to them. And I think that is wrong. I think 
the teaching should be in such a way that they are able to still identify what is true and what is false outside of the local church. So I think those pers- those actions will help us, you know, as believers, embrace the whole counsel of God when we appreciate what the body of Christ altogether has to offer each one of, each one of us in order to grow and to be built into the stature of Christ Jesus. I just thought I'd add that. Yes, thank you, Ose. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and that's so true because we can see that God works in his body globally. So, you know, we've learned about moves of God, we've learned about, um, you know, the uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, different parts of the world, and how it affects uh, the body of Christ at large. So, yes, we have to be open for that and uh, for us to be able to receive again say i think it's the understanding of the kingdom of god which needs to come in otherwise we uh, tend to be limited to what god is doing only in our local body and we miss out the fact that hey uh, we are all part of the kingdom of god which is way larger than the local church that each one of us belongs to we praise God for planting us in our local churches and what we are learning, how we are being equipped in our local churches. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, we learn how to flow with what God is doing uh, in the kingdom of God. Uh, and when we have that understanding, say, as you rightly pointed out, uh, teaching from just our local body is helpful. Uh, however, when people are equipped in the basics they have a strong foundation uh, a pastor or a leader may not may uh, need not feel insecure that hey you know some somebody listens to another preacher what if they don't come back to me or what if they don't come back to my church no god is releasing revelation okay uh, and in fact people must be encouraged to learn from what is God, what God is releasing uh, through other ministers. And no wonder uh, God has given in the body of Christ many teachers, many apostles, many pastors, many uh, prophets and uh, evangelists. So uh, yes, why not? We can receive from everyone and uh, we must encourage people to be open, right? But of course, uh, we understand the concern that pastors may have. Their concern is, oh, I have worked so hard to equip people uh, in uh, the whole council of God's word. They should not uh, get distracted. They should not get, uh, you know, misaligned from the truth of God's word. That's the concern pastors have. But, uh, you know, once we have given them a good foundation, I don't think we should worry so much, right? Uh, we equip them with the truth and uh, we trust that they will have the discernment over time to figure out what is okay, what is not okay. All right. So, yes, we shall leave it at that. And I, I hope uh, that discussion was helpful for many of us. Anything else uh, that comes to your mind or questions? It's good. It's good to think about what we are learning. Okay, so we see, right? We understand the kind of ministry that Paul had. Um, yes, he was called to be an apostle. So you see him planting churches uh, as part of that, uh, you know, calling. You you see that, you know, he was also able to uh, raise up leaders we see that god gave him the grace to teach and equip people so uh, all the capacities that god gave him you know, he was completely utilizing it and we've seen 
right? Like that uh, he, uh, while he was traveling, he was so concerned about the various churches that he had planted. Um, uh, we, we've uh, seen that you know he had to quickly move out of. Uh, uh, the church in Corinth, he couldn't spend much time because of the uproar uh, in that church. So when he moved out of there, uh, you know, at, at some point he wrote back to the Galatians, he wrote back to the Corinthians, uh, and then, you know, we will see that he will continue to write back to many of the churches, you know, uh, encouraging them and uh, exhorting them to stay on, uh, stay on course and keep growing in the Lord. Okay, so the third missionary journey, just for us to, uh, you know, be in sync, let me see, I will share the image of the third missionary journey with us, the map. Okay, I hope you can all see it. Is it visible? Yeah. OK, great. So we'll just have a look at it. We said that the second missionary journey he completed by going back to Antioch. And then he had a very short stay in Antioch. And then you know he restarts. He begins his journey. Also notice this uh, third missionary journey of uh, Paul. Uh, it's from 53 AD to 58 AD, about three to four years, it is estimated he spent uh, at this uh, main city called as Ephesus. So incredible ministry was done there. Um, it fa in fact, it is an example. Ephesus is an example where not just a couple of people, a small group of people, but the entire city felt the impact of the ministry of Paul. So couple of things uh, right happened over there we saw that unusual miracles took place through through his ministry we we saw that uh, you know uh, uh, Though this was this was a so-called spiritual city where people dabbled in the occult, they saw that the power of God, which was expressed through Paul's life, was so much greater than the sorcery that they practiced. So they tried um, uh, imbibing the principles which Paul used, which is to rebuke demon spirits in the name of Jesus. So they tried it. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? They just used the principles, but they were not born again. So it didn't work for them because... Uh, they did not carry the authority in the spiritual realm. As children of God, as born again believers, we carry the authority. And we can use the authority in the name of Jesus, but they couldn't use it. So all these things took place in the city of Ephesus. Then, of course, you know, you have your uh, uh, two years of intense training in the school of Tyrannus. And notice, you know, Ephesus, remember in the last class we said that uh, this is modern day, you know, this is Asia, uh, uh, those days known as Asia Minor, today modern day Turkey. You know, Turkey is, is over here. And uh, many of these, these uh, like this region, the, the seven churches of the book of Revelation, uh, Paul would have actually uh, planted those churches through some of his co-workers by now. Remember, though we are only talking about Paul's missionary journey and Paul's life, simultaneously a lot is happening. Uh, if you recall, Paul had left people like, uh, uh, you know, Silas, uh, Luke uh, in Macedonia, in different places, and they were there, you know, raising up people, equipping people. He had left behind Aquila, Priscilla in, uh, uh, you know, Corinth. So they were doing a job. They were doing a work there. Uh, Apollos had come and joined them in Corinth. So simultaneously, there are men and women of God who continue to serve the Lord with the calling on their lives. So uh, for us, you know, think about this entire region experiencing a mighty revival. So there are churches, there are leaders, there is a lot going on okay, in, in this entire region. And Ephesus played a key role because of the school there. So uh, our knowledge is that many people came to Ephesus, they were equipped there. So one of the uh, individuals that, you know, we, we can talk about is um, uh, 
what's epaphras epaphras from colosse okay so paul planted that church through epaphras he did not go physically to plant the colossian church but this was the individual who was trained most likely in the school of tyrannus so many people had come uh, from this entire region okay to that school and so it was an advantage actually for paul uh, we don't know how many people he actually equipped but he did he did impact the lives of many people not just from the city but from around the the uh, region uh, and uh, you know they went back carried the same fire which paul carried and they planted uh, you know different churches so Ephesus is a very key thing. So we know that from Antioch, he went through the Gal Galatia region, through the familiar churches, uh, primarily stayed in Ephesus, did a lot of teaching there. When opposition arose, uh, remember the silversmith called Demetrius and the whole chaos about uh, uh, the, the idol of Dinah and, uh, you know, uh, them not... Go, not doing well in business because of the ministry of Paul. He just left. He fled Ephesus. And then, you know, he moves on, goes to Troas, uh, and then, you know, the journey carries on. So uh, we see that, you know, he uh, makes a quick journey you know, around, and then uh, comes back, comes back. And then, uh, you know, we, we were talking just now about Miletus. So he came back. Uh, uh, on this third missionary journey, he came to this place called Miletus. On the way back, see, he could have gone to Ephesus, but we said that it wasn't safe for him to go there. So over here is where he meets the people, the elders, spends time with them, and then he will make his way back. So, you know, uh, you would have all these places. Tara. He'll go back to Tyre. Uh, Ptolemais, Caesarea, and of course, Jerusalem. So that's how it's going to work. So let's continue till uh, uh, the next chapter, Acts 21. You know, we, we uh, are still on the third missionary journey of Paul. It has not uh, ended yet. So let's observe, you know, you'll, you will come across all these places, Tyre and uh, uh, Ptolemais, Maes, sorry for my pronunciation whoever is from those regions please excuse me uh, caesarea okay uh, and then of course jerusalem so let's go on uh, i would request somebody to read acts chapter 21 these are all going to be uh, fairly easier passages that we can cover very fast so uh, could somebody read uh, acts chapter 21 uh, and i would Oh, yeah, it's pretty long. Uh, so, kindly read till verse 14, Acts 21, 1 to 14, and then we will come back to the next section there. Yeah, was there a question? Uh, no. no. Okay. And then, this one, please read Acts 21, verses 1 to 14. Can I read a question? Yes. yes. And when we had parted from them, and set sail, we came by a straight course to Coates, and the next day to Rhodes. And from there to Patra, and having found a sheep crossing the Phoenicia, and we went abroad and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the sheep was unload, unloaded its cargo, and having sought out the disciples. We stayed there for seven days, and to the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go into Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on journey. They all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and the Britain home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, but we arrived at Pro Potolomius, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. And the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the 
house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying from Angles, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews of the Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we seized and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Thank you, Asha. So, uh Basically, it's a continuation of the third missionary journey. So we noticed the different places that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, Tyre is one of the uh, places there. And, uh, you know, uh, if you observed, it, it says, verse 5, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children Till we were out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. So basically what we recognize here is that even though these were not places that were mentioned earlier in the second missionary journey, it's likely, as I told you, the gospel had spread across the region. So there are churches that uh, maybe Paul never, he never went to those places. He doesn't know these people. But notice there were wives, there were children. So there are a lot of people who are believers and they share this love for the people of God. So uh, that that brotherly love exists. Though they were different congregations, that brotherly love existed. They were hospitable to, to Paul. There's also uh, some kind of a Christian culture, uh, as uh, you would notice that, um, you know, they went with Paul to say bye to him. We don't know if this was commonly practiced, you know, to, to bid farewell to somebody who was dear to you. You go with them and then it says, knelt down on the shore and prayed. Uh, so maybe these believers practiced such things, kneeling down on the shore, praying, calling upon the Lord. So there was this, uh, this um, uh, fellowship, this, uh, you know, brotherly love, which people had and a culture sort of, you may want to call it a Christian culture or a church culture or something. So they, they had developed a culture of their own and it was developing, uh, you know, uh, for them and then eventually we see that uh, Paul went to Caesarea and the highlight of Caesarea is remember Philip Philip uh, uh, we talked about him in Acts 8 as a wall Acts uh, 6 as a volunteer Acts 8 he goes and he does his ministry in different regions Samaria and then you know he moves on uh, and uh, he ministers to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch over there, you never really have a title for Philip. But over here, notice, it says the house of Philip the Evangelist was it. The house of Philip the Evangelist. So uh, we understand that maybe you know Philip has had grown in his stature before the Lord um, to have a ministry, right? The kind of ministry uh, uh, that we would call as an evangelist ministry. So uh, he was now recognized as an evangelist. So that's why Luke uses the title here. He says evangelist Philip. And uh, other uh, important things about Philip is he had four daughters, virgin daughters who prophesied. So this also helps us understand that the gifts of the spirit were released to people irrespective of their gender. So it's remember when we talked about Acts uh, uh, 2, when God poured out his spirit and, you know, Peter stood up and he preached. He said that God will pour out his spirit. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. And so you have and, uh, you know, the the um, outworking of that particular scripture where women are prophesying 
okay they prophesied so obviously there was uh, this gift was probably uh, not just the the gift that operates at the level of a believer but may be the grace gift of prophecy otherwise you know uh, luke wouldn't mention that because every believer every believer could manifest these gifts it's likely that these women prophesied uh, you know at a higher level so the virgin daughters of philip where uh, they prophesied uh, but then another key thing that we notice in caesarea is agabus if you recall agabus was the prophet who came to antioch of syria and he prophesied that there is going to be a famine in jerusalem which led people to collect you know um uh, some funds and then for uh, paul to actually take it to the church of jerusalem so it's the same agabus so agabus over here he comes and you know he speaks a prophetic word how does he do it he does it through action so he takes paul's belt he wraps it around himself and he says look uh, the person whose belt you know this uh, belongs to will be bound like this so remember when we talked about the prophetic we said that the prophetic can be uh, expressed in various ways we can just say the prophecy or the prophecy can also be enacted we uh, see this form of prophesying in the old testament you know, prophets of god uh, and through the action of their lives they prophesied the word of god similarly agabus he acts out the prophetic word to tell paul that you are you will be bound when you go to jerusalem and so paul already knew no wonder he had that you know uh, good time with the ephesian elders however the intention of the brethren was to warn paul because they loved him so much they did not want any harm to happen to paul so they were hinting at paul don't go okay don't go that side because you will not come back alive if you go to jerusalem and we may never meet you but you see uh, when well meaning believers were instructing paul against the purpose of god for paul's life what was his response let's look at verse 12 and then you know i'll read from there now when we heard these things both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to jerusalem so even luke is involved in this that's why he's saying we luke maybe philip uh, and the whole gang that is with him agabus everyone's telling paul please don't go verse 13 then paul answered what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart for i am ready not only to be bound but also to die at jerusalem for the name of the lord jesus so you see there uh the commitment that paul had in his heart for the lord he knew tough times uh, lie ahead but in his heart he had already resolved he was determined if it means that i will die i'm ready to die for the sake of the gospel okay so you know we we say like allegiance in those times when people express the, their patriotism to their to their land uh, they would go to the extent of saying i'm willing to die for my country okay so people of those times understood you know this kind of a commitment that yes uh, i i would rather die for my land similarly you know you have paul the apostle here saying i would rather die for the gospel don't stop me from moving in the direction that god has uh, instructed me to take so paul was willing to move in that direction and go to jerusalem so verse 14 so when he would not be persuaded obviously you know, paul yes it's dangerous it's risky all of that but i need to do what god has called me to do so he was not persuaded uh, luke says we ceased we stopped uh, saying the will of god will of the lord be done so everyone said okay paul do do whatever you think uh, god is calling you to do so we will pick up from there uh, is there a question uh, yes say you have something to say uh, 
observation and question. Um, the the life of Philip is a it's an inspiring um, story. Um, you know, starting from just a normal believer who volunteered himself to serve tables, God using him in Samaria, and then years later we hear of him becoming an evangelist. It just shows that God does reward faithfulness in little things. And he sees us and he knows where he's taking us to. Um, so that, that, that I just wanted to bring as an observation that how God raised him up. And not just only that, gave him four children, you know, who were highly gifted in the prophetic. So that is an encouragement to many of us, you know, who might think that, oh, what we are just doing is lead to in church and God doesn't see it, but God does see our little effort, our little work. What man does not celebrate, God does see it. And in time, he will raise us up for higher callings. And my question, my other question is, um, do you think that uh, Paul knew that he was going to go through what he went through in Jerusalem? I know he had he had the conviction in his heart that um, he was bound to suffer for the gospel of Christ. But in, in a way, too, I kind of see if we fast forward down to where he gets to Jerusalem, which we'll still look at, the way he was being treated, you know, and all that he went through before getting to Rome. It, it seems to me that he might not have been expecting that magnitude of persecution. But he knew somewhere in his heart that he was going to face very, very, very tough times. Um, but I don't know. Do you think he actually had, you know, uh, uh, an idea of what he was going to go through? Or he was just going because he knew it was the will of God? Uh, because in a way, if we bring it down to our own world and we hear a prophecy or somebody warning us, <laughs> That if we go so this this direction, you might face a danger. We might say, "Well, God is trying to warn me to avert the the, the uh, to avert such journey," you know. But Paul, to an extent, it seems like he already had an idea of what he was going to be going through. So I just wanted to maybe get more clarification on on uh, Paul's journey to Jerusalem in terms of knowing that there was a prophet who never lied. I guess people really took Agabus' prophecy very serious. And this was somebody who was well seasoned. And, you know, others were warning him and all that. But yet, he was so resolved in going. Um, so, did he, do you think he just knew about what he was about to face in Jerusalem? Yeah, thank you, Say. So, uh, as you were sharing about Philip, uh, I just wanted to say amen, brother. It was sounded more like a sermon, actually. Very encouraging and uh, true. Looking at the life of Philip and the way God blessed him, uh, uh, strengthened him in the ministry, uh, and not just that, you know, in his life, you see that uh, how wonderful to have children who uh, are walking in the Lord and serving the Lord. So, he had four daughters who prophesied it just goes to tell us that uh, there was an anointing on their lives as well so what a reward uh, for the faithfulness of of a man of god so yes very true now you say, uh, your question there say in act 20 verses 22 to 25 we've already seen what paul said you know he said something like and see um now i go bound in the spirit to jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the holy spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me but none of these things move me nor do i count my life dear to myself so that i may finish my race with joy and the ministry which i received from the lord jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of god and indeed now i know that you all among whom i have gone preaching the kingdom of god will see my face no more so it just goes to say that paul was in full knowledge that he not return that something terrible is going to happen eventually he knew so and look at this see how god is is working he already knew and you have somebody like agabus come and tell him this is going to happen to you paul please don't go please don't go but uh 
you know, when there is a determination, when there is a surrender, when there is a commitment uh, to the Lord, uh, he he just knew that. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but I will go. And in fact, verse 4 of Acts uh, 21, it says, And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So you see, the prophetic word is confirmed twice. There were believers who told him, Agabus who told him, but he knew everything. But he knew that's the way he had to take because God had a purpose in it. So that's uh, the answer, say he knew. God had communicated it to him. Okay, so um, yeah, let's uh, take a break now. Take a 10 minute break and then we shall come back and uh, proceed. Thank you, everyone.